Oh, some of you are like, all right. So you, you told me about Vance. He converted to Catholicism. And on Friday, you guys basically said, if you get Vance, you get Leonard Leo. And I stand behind that. Like JD Vance is the pick for the, the Leonard Leo set. I mean, when you get JD Vance, you get, you get the Patrick Janines of the world. Like JD Vance fits perfectly in a, in a, a cohort of Clarence Thomas, of Sam Alito, of Patrick Deneen, of Leonard Leo, Opus Dei, the Federalist Society, the Napa Institute. These people are so excited about J.D. Vance as the pick, period. And I don't think the mainstream media sees that. I don't think most people understand that this is not a hillbilly pick. This is not a, you know, whatever. Now, the other side of it, you're like, well, wait a minute, Brad. You started on Friday by saying this was about Musk and Teal. Are you forgetting about that? And I am not. J.D. Vance holds two sides of the of the reactionary right. And I want to just give you one more guy that we need to be aware of. And some of you out there already know about him, and that's fine. And, and if, if you do, this will be a review. But if J.D. Vance is the guy that gives you Leonard Leo and Patrick Deneen and, and, and that whole set of, of pre-modern Catholic, Catholics, he also gives you the reactionary Silicon Valley people. Now, you all know about Peter Thiel. You all know about Elon Musk. You need to know about Curtis Yarvin. Some of you do already. That's fine. Curtis Yarvin is the, the quote unquote philosopher of the Peter Thiel you know, entourage. He's the guy who has been blogging for a long time. He has this uh, moniker, Mencius Moldbug. He's been written about everywhere. You can look in The Baffler. You can look at Vox. You can look at Politico. Curtis Yarvin is not religious in the ways that Vance is, but he's a monarchist. He has said that it would be joyous if democracy was overthrown. He wants to get rid of all government workers. His, his moniker, his, his acronym that he put forth is Retirement All Government Employees, RAGE. He wants to do what? He wants an, an executive branch that is so powerful that it has sway over the entire government kind of sounds like project 2025. It also sounds like a monarchy. He thinks that we have gotten to a place and this sounds like the where life has become so defined by woke liberals in the media and in the Academy that real power, real freedom, real human life cannot exist outside of the Atlantic and the New Yorker and Princeton and Harvard and, and Bill Gates and Microsoft and whoever. So you know what we need? Here's what he literally wants a monarchy with a board of directors. That's kind of an oligarchy around him kind of sounds like a Silicon Valley CEO who has a board around him that helps him direct the company. Also, also sounds a lot like a guy named Putin. It very much does. Like like if you're looking for those parallels, right? So I'm not making this up. He has said democracy would be good if it went. He wants to completely change and overrun our current political system. He thinks all government employees should be retired. And remember when I started Friday with that quote from from J.D. Vance saying that uh, Donald Trump should fire all the federal workers. And then when the Supreme Court says you're wrong, just say to them, come get me. If I had played you the entire clip, it begins with there's this guy named Curtis Yarvin, and he's where I got that idea, essentially. So here we have J.D. Vance, and J.D. Vance holds together these two reactionary right-wing movements that may seem different, but hold very similar ideas about why democracy is not a good form of government. That is the senator who is now the VP pick of the Republican Party. You have the Catholics, like Patrick Deneen, who want common good conservatism and to impose this vision, this anti-LGBTQ vision on the entire American electorate. They want to impose things that you are like, well, what do you, what do you mean? And common good conservative, how does that affect me? It affects you when we have an abortion ban, when we have an IVF ban, when we have a contraception ban, when we have a ban on HRT. Those are the things they want to do as common good conservatives. And then you have the Silicon Valley reactionary right wingers, the monarchists in Silicon Valley who are like, yeah, democracy, not good. We're the smart people. We're the Silicon Valley luminaries. We should be in charge. Give us a CEO who's one of us and then give him a board of directors that'll help him figure it out. Dan, they're both into Aristoi. 
They're both into elites who will order the world for the common good who, I'm sorry, for the common man who just doesn't know how to organize their own life. And J.D. Vance holds both of them together. And Kurt, there's increasingly crossover between the Curtis Yarvins of the world and the Claremont Institutes of the world. So there's a podcast with Michael Anton, the guy who, who, who's part of the Claremont Institute and Curtis Yarvin having a discussion, right? And what I'm trying to convey to everybody is that the J.D. Vance pick, it was just not about getting Musk's money, even though I think it's part of it. It was not just about, oh, he's from Ohio. Cool. It was not just about like, you know, he's kind of good at talking about MAGA stuff. No, like there is so much behind the J.D. Vance pick that is so sinister. And it makes me think that if we have to not let Donald Trump and this ticket win, not only because Trump is a maniacal narcissist who wants to be a king and a dictator, but because his the guy on his VP, the, the guy he chose as his VP is really the one that the Leonard Leos and the Peter Thiels are hoping will be president someday. I mean, they are really hoping it's him. Donald Trump is a, is a way station. If you think it will be bad with Trump, I cannot imagine if J.D. Vance got in there and started doing this stuff that Yarvin and Deneen and the rest are uh, influencing him to do. So any final thoughts on this before we, we go to some other things? Yeah, so first... You said the Leonard Leo set, and I feel like that's a good big band yeah, name. Yeah. Like so the, the the Leonard Leo set. Yeah. The, um, yeah, they're opening for the Catholic Aristoy. Yeah. I mean exactly. yeah, yeah. Like some some variety show. Um but but so just a couple of things to tie this together. So when when regular people hear the word the common good, the phrase the common it's this incredibly philosophically freighted word, but I think it operates as a good code because it sounds good. Who could be opposed to the common good? And what people need to understand is when somebody like Deneen or Vance or somebody else uses the common good, they do not mean that which is in the best interests of everybody or that which will help everybody, right? That's not what they mean by the common good. Somebody who's what we might call a utilitarian might say, we need to have policies that, you know, help the greatest number of people in this or that way or whatever. That's not what it means. It is some group's particular vision of the good that will be enforced on others. So, as you're outlining this common good, if you identify as trans, this doesn't feel good. If you're a person of color, this doesn't seem real good. If you're a working class person, I think this is not good. So I think that's the the first thing to recognize because it can really throw people. It can be because, you know, who who wants to be opposed to the common good? It is this this kind of code word that doesn't mean what people think it means. And then the second one is if everyone wants to take all everything we've been talking about and distill it down and be like, okay, is it like I can't, you know, Labor Day, we got the you know, cookout with with Uncle Ron. I can't like trot out all the like Project 2025. Like like seriously, distill it all down, put it in a pressure cooker, boil it down, and see what's left. That is your document that says this is what it would look like. All those intellectual currents, political currents, economic currents, ideological currents are flowing together into that one place, which is why. They pushed it so hard. It's why they've been shopping it around. They worked really hard on this. Now they're trying to pretend it doesn't exist. But if you want to go to a place and see in concrete terms how all this plays out, there's the blueprint. Well, and I think I think what we can talk about with Project 2025 is the what and the why. Like, I think, I yeah. think you can explain to Uncle Ron, here's what it is. Or you can explain to your neighbor who's not sure they want to vote for Kamala Harris. You can explain it to your, your young, you know, 19 year old son who's not sure they care to vote this time. You can explain it, right? Anyone who's like, why should I vote? Why Kamala Harris? Why the Democrat? Right. You can just have, and there's plenty of these online, a nice little cheat sheet of what, 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 what project 2025 would do. The last 40 minutes on Deneen and Vance and Yarvin is the why, why project 2025? Why would they want this? Why would they do it? Because friends, they're not conservative libertarians. This is not Barry Goldwater. This is not, uh, you know, uh, uh, ran, this is not any of the Rands. Ayn Rand, Rand Paul, none of the Rands. Ayn <laughs> Rand, <laughs> they're out. No more libertarian laissez-faire, just let it happen. This is common good conservatism means why Project 2025? So we can impose order on you. And if you're not in order, if your body's not in order, if your identity's not in order, if your marriage, your love, your desire, your sex, your family's not in order, well, we're going to get government and laws and policies to get it in order. 
that is the that is the why of Project 2025. And I think that that's important because I think one reaction, just regular people, again, or the uninitiated, or somebody hears, they'll hear Project, they'll be like, that can't be real. There's no, there's no way. Why would anybody do that? Why would anybody say that? Why would anybody think that? And this is the, it, it takes, it takes a deeper dive to get the context, but this is the context. This is the kind of social world, the thought world in which that makes sense, in which that is desirable, in which that is an ideal society. And I think that's what helps it to just not be ridiculous, right? It doesn't mean you agree with it, but to be able to understand it and be like, oh, that's why these people say this. I don't agree with them. I don't have the same vision of society that they have. I don't have the same vision of God that they have. I don't have the same vision of any number of things. I think that's what helps it to seem as if it's not just crazy and, and therefore easily dismissed.